Yes, it's that time of the year again, one of the most significant parts of the medical career process here in Australia. It's internship application time. And in this video, I'm going to show you how you can apply for one of the estimated 3,779 internships that are on offer in Australia currently, including who's eligible for them, how the intern priority system actually works across Australia, all your key dates, how to improve your prospects of getting a certain hospital network, tips for making sure you don't miss out, answering the question, can international doctors apply for internships in Australia? And importantly, how much are you gonna get paid and a little bit about your working conditions. Hi there guys, I'm Dr. Anthony Wellen here, the career doctor, I'm a real doctor who knows a lot about the medical recruitment process, particularly down under here in Australia. So you're here to find out about the medical internship process for 2023. So let's get straight into it, starting out with your key dates. So I'm gonna hop over here to a blog post that's now currently live on the Career Doctor channel. And we do this every year, Medical Internship Australia application guide for you guys. So at the time of recording this, um, it's 4th of May. Um, so we'll be updating it through the process. Most of the information is now current for this year's application process, but there are a few states that are a bit lagging on some of their information. Particularly, I'm shouting out to you, Western Australia, Tasmania, Northern Territory, ACT. I'll forgive the Commonwealth for now because they come a little bit later, but hopefully in the next week or so, we'll have all the key figures up there. So some of this information at the moment is from last year, but most of it is key. So the first thing you want to start out looking at with is your key application dates. So you can see them listed here. Uh, at the moment and you should really come to grips with these if you're applying for internship this year so your applications open on the 9th of may 2022 so probably around the time that i post this video applications will start to open and my key tip there is go in now to every state and territory that you're thinking of applying to and check out what you need to do to apply. So I'm basically talking here about going to the application portal, registering, going as far through the process as you can to find out what information you need, but not submitting until you're, you're ready to put in your preferences or whatever. Now, you'll see here, as per usual, there is a fairly tight period for application. So it's usually about a month, so 9th of May, with applications closing on the 6th of June, 2022. In most states and territories, it's 5 p.m. business hours, and they're pretty strict about not accepting an application after the fact. A couple of other things that you'll need to make sure that you've got is your intern placement number. We'll talk about that shortly. As I said, go through all the application requirements in the portals so that you don't come across surprises. As soon as the application system opens, Register, log in, ensure you have everything you need to complete your application. Go looking for those documents. You know, it might take you a while. This is why you want to apply early because you don't want to be waiting for a document to be sent to you in a fairly strict timeline. You need to kind of get all that stuff organized now. Now you need to know where you sit on the priority list for any state or territory you're applying to. We'll talk a little bit about that looking at how those vary from state to state and territory to territory. Recognize that in some states and territories for some processes you may have to attend an interview so you should be thinking now about whether you need leave from your medical school requirements to attend and thinking about getting some practice in. Consider that some of your interviews might be via phone or video. Victoria has this sort of interesting recorded video interview system. For most applications you're going to need a resume so that will require a bit of time to put it together and require some referees. So again this is a reason why you should be getting organized now not waiting to the last minute because it's really rude to put someone down as a referee on your resume without asking them first. You'll notice here that there's a consistency around dates. We'll talk about the offers a little bit shortly when we go through some of the states and territories, but offers for rural and other special pathways this year's up, they've been, they've been uh, nationalized if you like. So there's a whole process that goes on where the states and territories coordinate all their key dates. So you see that that application opening date is the same for New South Wales, Tasmania, ACT, Northern Territory, everywhere. Same with the application close. And this year also, the states and territories have agreed that they will do their special pathway offers, which are usually for things like rural internships, Aboriginal uh, preferential internship, that sort of stuff. Uh, they'll come out first on 18th of July, which I believe is Monday. And then the first offers for all the main round pathways, which is when most of the internship positions are allocated, again, all across Australia will come out on the 20th of July. So you need to make sure that you're available and have particularly have access to the, your email at these times because usually the timeframes for accepting offers are quite short. Usually within 48 hours, you've got to 
accept your offer. So you won't have access to the email that you're using for your applications. Now this process rolls on for several months as they kind of offer places and people decline, etc. and they go to the next rounds. The actual national close date for intern recruitment is Friday 18th of November, 2022. Uh, this is all, of course, for starting in 2023. Uh, and that's one thing that is different from state and territory is this starting date. So don't worry though, if it's got to the point of, and you're watching this in November, that the intern recruitment date is about to close. After the nationally coordinated dates close, all remaining vacant intern positions move into what's called the late vacancy management process. And that's, they, they continue to be out, allocated out ad hoc if there are spare uh, intern positions as they come through, through to around February, even term two, sometimes for starting term three in the following year. So the other hot tip is stay in touch with your medical school. They've probably already sent out some information. You may be worried about things like completing your degree on time, but they're all very working very hard to give you the best chance of getting your internship next year. And of course, they're a key link for things like your medical intern placement number, which is a unique nine digit number that's given to you by ARPA, that's the Australian Health Practitioners Regulation Agency. Some people call that the medical board, if there is a difference. Uh, but in any case, you've got a number that's provided to medical schools to all final year medical students. I should say 2022, I'll go back and fix that after the video. And this number is used as part of the national intern to an audit process. So you need this to put in your applications. Now there are some situations where you won't be issued an IPN. Normally you'll get this from your medical school. If you're applying as a non-Australian medical student, you don't require that IPN. But you know, if you're in those particular categories, just recognize that your chances of getting an internship are reasonably slim as well. And I'll get to the question of international medical students shortly when we go through some of the priority lists. Some other things you might need, and we've talked about the fact that you may need, or well, you'll need to get registered as part of this process. So one of those requirements for ARPA registration is English language. Now, it might seem a bit ridiculous given that you've been attending medical school in English for the last four or five years, but it is the law. So if you came from somewhere else where you needed to do an English language test and your IELTS is not up to date, make sure you've got that sorted. Go and check your requirements on the medical board. As I said, most states and territories will request you to submit a CV or resume. And the main exception for most rounds is the New South Wales one. Uh, but think, for things like rural preferential, you require that for New South Wales as well. So you can, uh, I'll leave some links in the videos above, uh, in video description below to things like uh, how to write your CV, also some tips on interviews, that sort of stuff. Uh, one thing about CVs is some states and territories do have a CV template that they suggest you use to fill in for your information. Now again, I need to update this. In, in Victoria, this has now become uh, non-mandatory as well. So it's in every, in every situation, it's up to you. I would suggest that if you're thinking about your future career, then now's a good time to be designing your own CV rather than using the uh, suggested template, particularly if it's not a man if you think. Uh, you'll need things like proof of identity, citizens, receipt, residence, visa. And if you've had a name change along the way, you'll possibly need to provide some extra documentation around that. So again, a good reason to go in and just make sure that you've got, you know all the things that you will need now at the start of this process so you've got time to do it and then you might be wondering why do they require all this information well it's about making sure that they've checked uh, that you are who you are that you've completed all the requirements it's about patient safety it's also about making sure you can start on time and employers get rightly annoyed when told someone who's been allocated to work with them as an intern might have a several months delay because they have to reset an english test for example so it is your responsibility as a professional to ensure that you are eligible for registration. So you should also be checking all these things yourself. Every year, it's unfathomable, but given the amount of communication from everywhere, health departments, medical schools, colleagues, but every year there are a handful of medical students who forget to apply for their internship. <coughs> and this basically means waiting another year. Don't let that be you. So as I said, research everything early and apply early. With most of the state and territory application systems, as I said, you can go fairly much all the way into the system without pressing the submit button and in some cases in that open and closing date you can go back and edit as well so you can go pretty much all the way through the system and do what you need and then give yourself a bit of time to think about it i wouldn't be late into waiting to the very last minute to sort of press save or submit but you can do most of the work now and you can find out as i said what things you might be needing to find like documents or maybe you weren't, weren't aware that there was like different preferences that you needed to select from and you now need to go back and research certain hospitals and hospital networks. Give yourself the time to research and apply early. I would suggest practicing your video interview technique, particularly if you are gonna to have to sit an interview. 
I'll leave some links to some videos about that. Find out about the priority list. We'll get into that very soon. But you need to know where you rank in this in this in the situation. Now, it will vary from state to state and territory to territory, and based on things like whether you're an Australian citizen, a domestic graduate, an international gra a student who's graduated from here, etc. As a general rule, though, if you're applying for your internship in the state that you went to medical school in, or are going to medical school in, you are top of the priority list generally. Okay, uh, if you are uh, so that's if you're an Australian citizen or permanent resident. If you're an Australian citizen or permanent resident and you went to medical school in another state or territory or even New Zealand, you're probably second or so. And if you're an international student who studied medicine in Australia, you're probably next. But it does vary and we'll go, th we'll show some of the differences there, but that's usually the rank order of things. If you're an, a student who studied in an offshore campus, you'll be next after that. And if you're an international doctor, maybe you haven't completed your internship, you'll be at the very bottom in some states and territories only. But it's very unlikely, and I've got to say this, answer this question now. I get asked this probably 500 times a year on Facebook, YouTube, etc. I'm an international medical graduate, how can I get an internship in Australia? It is theoretically possible to do that, and I'll show you particularly how that works in places like Queensland and South Australia. It's theoretically possible to get an internship position in certain circumstances, but it's practically not very likely that it'll happen for you and you shouldn't make it your only strategy certain. So in most cases, internship is off the cards for international medical graduates. That's that's the key thing to know, okay? And I bet that's not gonna stop most of you watching all the way through the video to find out about the exceptions, but that's okay. I've done my upfront caveat, um, disclaimer, etc., etc. Know your key dates, including offer dates. We talked about that. You need to be available for all those rounds and you want to be available well you need to be available for when you think you might get the offer the first time you know if you haven't got an offer then you've got to keep being available basically uh, so make sure you've got access to your email and contacts as i said there are priorities within priorities and we'll talk about that we'll talk about that by focusing on the jurisdictions now we've got through the main bulk of business let's talk about where you can get your internships from now so let's look firstly at the state of new south wales which is my I guess home state, uh, that's where I reside. I was originally from Tasmania, but I've been here for many, 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 many years. Lovely picture there of the Sydney Harbour Bridge from Luna Park. <laughs> I was struggling to remember the name of the uh, the show place there. That's on the north side of Sydney Harbour. So this year in New South Wales, there will be 1,100 intern positions. Can you believe that? When I was the medical director at HEDI, which is Health Education and Training Institute, which is the organization that runs the internship system in New South Wales, I was hoping we'd crack a, a thousand at some point, and I knew we would, but it was a few years after I left that position, and they went through the barrier, I think maybe last year, and certainly they're well over it now, aren't they? They're, they're there with some GSD on top, and including 220, 202 rural preferential posts. So that's more posts than uh, available in Tasmania, ACT combined, uh, and certainly also in the territory of Northern Northern Territory. So that's really super impressive. And I think one of the good things about the New South Wales program is the attention to priority workforce, including rural um, internships. And these are across 15 networks. So this will vary. This is one thing that will vary from place to place. But usually now in most states and territories, you're not just being employed as an intern at a hospital. There'll probably be one or two other, there might be a main hospital and then one or two other rotating hospitals, smaller places, maybe in the same city or or maybe, you know, in a rural location or within the sort of region, what have you. So usually you're applying for an internship across the networks. So again, good thing to do is to research the networks and find out what are the rotations, you know. You might want to go somewhere because you like that place, but make sure that you're going to stay there for enough time and be aware that you might have to sort of go and do a rural turn. That might be a particular requirement. So another good thing about New South Wales is you get a length of contract for two years, okay? It's still as far as I can work out, only New South Wales and Western Australia give you a longer contract than one year for your internship. I am a strong advocate of this. The there's a number of reasons why, but the, I think the critical main reason is it takes the pressure off. Your, your internship is meant to be kind of a consolidation experiential learning year. Um, and, you know, most people get through it okay without too many blips or problems. But occasionally there is a problem where, you know, maybe didn't things didn't work well for you. Maybe you got sick for a protracted period of time. Maybe you just was struggling in a particular term and you need a little bit more time to get up the requirements, which are 
uh, according to the medical board, I think it's 48 weeks full time that you have to complete, supervised, and including satisfactory completion of 10 weeks of medicine, 10 weeks of surgery, and eight weeks in emergency medicine are the key requirements. So you have to satisfy your internship prior to getting general registration. You have to be signed off by usually your director of training or the uh, the may, uh, in fact, uh, often be a committee that makes the final determination. So occasionally some people do need a bit more time. Well, if you've got a two-year contract, that's built in. So you're kind of not worrying about your performance. You, you know there's a little bit of a leeway there if you if you are struggling. And the, and, the, and that's good for the hospitals as well because also they're not having to just re-employ you again for another year and go through another recruiting process. Whereas if you've got a one-year internship, you're kind of applying for jobs, honestly, six months in where you haven't had a lot of experience applying for the next level of jobs. I don't know how hospitals can really evaluate interns for resident positions and make any particular high distinction based on four or five or six months worth of performance. It's pretty ridiculous. So good thing about New South Wales and Western Australia, your contract is longer than one year. In New South Wales, it's two. WA's even better, it's three years. Not so good things about New South Wales. You'll notice the annual salary, if you look at all the other ones that are coming up, it is the worst in the country, which is interesting. When I did my internship, I think it was one of the, if it's not the best, it was one of the best in the country. It's slowly fallen behind everyone else. Other things that have sort of fallen behind are things like professional development allowance and leave. There is no professional development allowance for any trainee doctors in New South Wales, whereas a lot of the other states and territories have now put uh, put in place an actual fund for professional development for training doctors. You may not necessarily get it as an intern, but in a number of states and territories, you'll get it once you become a resident, which is your PGY2, your second year. Now, if you do get your internship in New South Wales, your orientation will be on the 23rd of January next year. This will differ from state and territory to state and territory. There was a process to try and align this nationally at one point as well which made a lot of sense, but it's fallen out of alignment and you'll see that it's different in a um, range of places. And you'll be starting on the 30th of January. One thing that usually now happens though, in every state and territory, this didn't happen in my day, it's much safer now, is there's usually like a two or three week period, including that orientation, where the new interns come in and the old interns stay as interns and the old residents stay as residents and the old registrar, especially trainees, stay as, stay as that as well so that you get a bit of a budding process and there's a handover process before everyone else shuffles up, which I think is much better from a patient safety perspective. It's well noted in the States, for example, that when they switch over, they call it, they've got this thing called the July effect and you see higher blips in terms of safety, um, poor safety outcomes and things like that. So, so your orientation will be late, Jan, uh, late January with a start on the 30th of January. So in New South Wales, there are four pathways. You have your Aboriginal recruitment pathway, um, and there's lots more information on my website about this, as well as links through to the various organisations that organise internship, where to apply for your jobs, that sort of stuff. So you can go into the detail a bit more for, uh, more fully. But New South Wales had the first, Abor Ab uh, first ever Aboriginal recruitment pathway, and basically that's a pathway for applicants who are of an Indigenous background, um, where they can get priority access to internship positions uh, around New South Wales. There's also a rural preferential pathway with a number of rural hospital sites that have really become almost self-sufficient really through this process in terms of most of the interns and residents they get. There's also a regional allocation pathway. Honestly, I never quite got this, <laughs> how this worked any different from the main pathway, but it's basically for the kind of new car, <laughs> Hunter and Wollongong, Illawarra and sort of Western Sydney regions to go a little bit earlier. And then you've got the main pathway, which is basically the remaining positions, which are generally in the Sydney kind of area for those main hospitals. Now you can see, and so it's in that order that they go out. As I said, the only applicants who need to submit a CV and attend an interview will be the rural preferential applicants. With the Aboriginal pathway that's done, there is an application process. You do have to do a bit of documenting and that's done by a committee with Indigenous representation. A key advantage of going Aboriginal, rural or regional is because uh, those net, those positions are allocated first, you're far more likely to be given your preferred hospital network. So this is my big tip for international students or anyone who's, yeah, international students who are studying in Australia. I'll just restrict it for that for now. If you're wanting to sort of maximise your chances of getting an internship in, a, in um, the system in Australia, because you're not in one of those guaranteed buckets, you, you, if you 
have enjoyed doing, where we had experienced rural health as part of your training and enjoyed it, strongly consider applying for rural preferential internship positions in the states and territories, uh, wherever that's available. It's a, it's a way of sort of really escalating your chances. And to be, you know, like, the, the thing about the system is if you do stay in long enough, you'll generally get allocated something it may be the following year. But again, if you want to get your offer a little bit earlier in the system, going rural is also a big advantage for you as well. Um, so think about those kind of special pathways if you're eligible for them. And obviously, if you're Indigenous, that there's, a, there's, there's a pathway for you there, which I think is great. You don't have to, if you're an Indigenous student, you don't have to apply for the pathway. It's an opt-in process, and I believe that's the same. Well, I would have hoped that's the same for every other state and territory. I believe it is. Uh, and with the regional one in New South Wales, anyone can ask for that. It's just about, I mean, you're not allowed to select a certain group of Sydney-based hospitals, basically. So you can see here, there's this, these six categories in, in New South Wales, and you'll still see similar ones in similar states and territories. Category one, uh, priority one is Australian or New Zealand citizens or permanent residents who are graduates of New South Wales uh, medical schools, okay? Then your category two are the same, but who have graduated from an interstate or New Zealand university or done their year 12 in New South Wales. And I'm struggling to work out what the difference is there now. Oh, and they have done their year 12 in New South Wales. Yes, sorry. That, so that distinguishes them from those who haven't. So basically saying if your state of origin is New South Wales, you get bumped up a little bit further than everyone else. So then that's everyone else category three. And usually in the first rounds, they get down to about category three and get them all allocated out. So I mean, anyone in those first three priorities, will, one and two normally will get one in with, you know, in that by that 20th of July, whatever that date is, three mostly will be allocated out and then that's sort of where they're sitting with for the, the rest of allocations. But you can read the reports, often they're very, very full and detailed reports now for some of the bigger jurisdictions that show how the process worked the previous year and the year after that. After that, you've got category four, which is non-Australian citizens or permanent residents. So these are generally the international students on visas. So that that will be, uh, and again, there's a priority within a priority. So if you graduated from a New South Wales medical school, you're category four. And so you'll go above ones from other universities uh, and finally ones from offshore campuses. So that's category six. There's a handful of those every year. So the two big bulk groups usually in New South Wales are category one and category four for obvious reasons, because you've got all the domestic medical student graduates in category one, and then you've got all the international students in New South Wales in category four. And so there's the priorities in sort of uh, sentences for you, but I grabbed that actually off the Hedy website. And Hedy is, uh, I'll just show you the page. Hedy is the uh, the organisation that I used to work for that organises medical intern recruitment in New South Wales. You'll find there's a lot of information on their website. They've got a very sophisticated um, application portal. It's mobile friendly, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, I did a bit of work on this years ago, but it's gone gangbusters since. And every year they've improved their information. And, contact. One thing to note is usually your contacts for this will be by email or there'll be some sort of phone line that you can contact and that'll be it. And that it'll usually be a nine to five or eight thirty to five type of thing. So they try all the states and territories to try and minimize the portals of contact for obvious reasons so that people are not getting less uh, left in the, uh, lost in the system. So if you do have a query about any sort of part of the process you can get in contact. You know. uh, for example the the portal goes down, you know um, for some reason or you, something didn't get saved properly then you can contact so so that's new south wales 1100 in new south wales now moving down to victoria 891 internships in victoria you can see that salary has gone up by about eight thousand dollars great although there is only a one-year contract however as an intern you get professional development allowance which is worth about three thousand odd dollars a year so that's good and that continues all the way through as a trainee doctor in victoria i think victoria probably my assessment of the award not having talked to having talked to a few doctors who've experienced it the award is the, the sort of set of rules and laws about what you get paid basically and how you're looked after in the job it's the professional development provisions are probably the best in australia you'll see there's a different term on state date uh, i don't know when orientation is because they haven't advertised it but in most states and territories it's usually now the week before. As I said, Victoria internships work around a computer matching system that's administered by the Postgraduate Medical Council of Victoria. Now the PMCV probably on a bit of a par with Hedy in terms of things it does and the, the amount of things it does. It does a lot of matches for training 
doctor positions now in Victoria, not just internships, but residents, a lot of specialty trainee posts, etc. Uh, nursing, I think, and uh, allied health positions as well sometimes. So it'll be it's the only actually the only state where you you see that word match used as well, which. You know, I sometimes get asked about the match system in Australia, which is what is used in North America. There is no real match system in Australia, but the PMCV does use that term. So, Victoria, you do need to have referees as well as a CV, and most of you will have to do an interview as well. Some of the hospitals will ask you to come for a live interview, but during that sort of period between the application and offer, there's a period where all the around Australia where all the sites can assess applicants and invite them for interviews, etc. Some metro hospitals might conduct live interviews, but there is an option for you to do a recorded interview. So basically the way that works is you sort of have to log in at a certain time, you get a bit of a practice to make sure you're all set up and then you'll get a question come up on the screen and you've got a certain amount of time to answer it. It gets recorded. I don't believe you get a chance to do it more than once. You have to be happy with your first answer. Uh, and then sort of 15 minutes later, they've captured three or four questions from you and that's all loaded up to a system somewhere where with appropriate logins etc the employers can go in and watch you asynchronously basically. It's something that's commonly used as like a first round step for interviewing for jobs in other industries. In Victoria you also have the option to go into what's called the VRPA group which is the Victorian Rural Preferential Allocation Group. Again that will give you priority access. There's two groups within that. There's the Australian Citizens or Permanent Residents who graduate from Victoria Medical School. So again you know see how each state looks after their own first which kind of makes sense. All the, This is all to do with an agreement between the state and federal government about how we guarantee internships in Australia and, and who responsible for how many. Uh, so that's how it kind of works out that each state tends to look after its amount and say, so we'll, we'll guarantee those in within our state and then the other states can look after the others and we'll make sure there's enough overall to go around. Your priority group two is anyone who's completed their schooling in Victoria, lived in a rural area, graduates of the from the Albury Wodonga Clinical School, as well as any sort of temporary residents can apply for that as well. So it, doesn't, so it doesn't look like you can just apply for a rural preferential if you're from somewhere else. And then you've got three priority groups for the, kind of the, the main priority rounds, if you like. Again, reflecting Victorian citizens and permanent residents from Victorian medical schools. Temp then this is different because they allow the international students to go above. This has always been a bit controversial, above the citizens and permanent residents from other states, which are priority three. Although they do have a special consideration process for interstate applicants. So if you've got a, you know, like maybe you've got family there, you've got a health problem or something like that or whatever, you can apply to sort of go up to priority group two. This is what I mean about researching your options. And so that's all written down there as well. Videos are hot linked from the PMCV site. They have a lot of useful information. Let's have a quick look at theirs as well. It's all well set out on their page. You can actually register, which is like just get your login now, which is great, but you won't be able to see, as I understand it, the rest of the system. You can fly from 9th of May. There's some recordings of talking you through various parts of the process. Timeline there, a bunch of other stuff, including I'm still waiting for that intern candidate guide to come, but I was actually able to pull the numbers from the health services directory info. So that was useful. Some information about the national audit. I, I've done a separate video on the national audit, but basically there's this thing that goes on in the background. And it's one of the reasons why there's coordinated dates because there are pauses between each round to allow this small team that's actually sitting in New South Wales to collect all the data from another country, see what's been allocated, who to, basically identify anyone who's sitting on more than one offer and then contact them and ask them to accept one and decline the rest and keep everything moving so that offers are done as early as possible and the jobs are filled as early as possible basically. You know, with, you'd imagine with like almost 4,000 internships around the country and the opportunity to actually apply to the various eight states and territories and maybe the Commonwealth process, it's very possible for some people to get more than one offer, which can delay someone else in a slightly lower priority around an offer unless that's all cleared up. Also some reading material, lots of resources there, so including your forms for sort of interstate special consideration, eligibility criteria. Actually, it's worth me just letting you know that every state will have a special consideration process, which is, you know, usually either for kind of family reasons or like you've got very young children or something like that, or specific health reasons where you need to be in a certain location because of your treatment or what have you. It's usually pretty strict and limited, but there is an ability to apply for special consideration to be 
allocated somewhere that suits you. So if there is a policy for that, you'll be able to find in every state and territory jurisdiction that runs the internship and a way of applying for special consideration if you do need that. Victoria allows you, this is another thing that's different, it allows you to defer your internship, I think for a year. Some states say if you just elect to defer, you've just got to reapply the following year. And they do have an example CV template, so it's, it's now no longer mandatory. So this is the much vaunted Victorian medical template. Those that know what my views on what a good resume or CV should look like will know why I feel this is probably not a great template for you to be using, particularly if you're going to go forward with it in your career. It's, and, and the issue is if you fill it in and like 100 other people fill it in, then it's going to look the same as everyone else. So you're not standing out either. But you know, photos, probably not, generally not a good idea on a medical CV. Lots of sort of useful information, but probably not cutting to the chase in terms of your education is actually on the second page. And when you're like, working, you actually want employment history on the first page as well. So, you know, if you're an RMO or registrar applying for jobs. But enough of that. So let's get back to the states and territories. So I think that's Victoria. Now Queensland, Queensland are all set up as well. They're ready to go. Um, they've got their numbers up to date. 805 with 61 rural generalist positions. Again, a salary close to that of Victoria, much better than New South Wales. Only one year contract, the term date, uh, a little bit a little bit between the two others. No professional development allowance for interns, but when you become a resident in Queensland, you do get a professional development allowance, so um, that's something to bear in mind. Queensland has one of the more complicated processes. There's a number of pathways. I'm not going to go into them in complete detail, but you can get it allocated to one of 20 employment hospitals. There are four groups for priority access. Again, similar stuff here. Medical graduates of Queensland universities who are citizens or permanent residents. Then the ones from other places, then the ones that aren't permanent residents, then then the rest, etc. Again, you can improve your chances by thinking about opting for the Rural Generalist Program. There is also an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander intern allocation initiative this year, which is great. There is also one in Victoria. I haven't pointed that out, but they've got one too now. So that's you know most parts of the country now have something for that. If you're interested in the Rural Generalist Program, this is one thing that's different from all the other states and territories. That goes a lot earlier, so your chances of applying for that this year are already over. Um, that is a, and I think that's, well, it's it's not quite an, it's, it's not quite like you've got an extended contract, but they do look after you, so you're not, I think, necessarily having to reapply for your job next year, whereas with the other ones, it's just a one-year contract. So, yeah, they have this kind of, oh, look, there's this process where they do all the Group A applicants via ballot, and then they look at which hospitals are undersubscribed or oversubscribed. One year they had like a little live dashboard to show who was going for what to try and kind of get everyone to self-select. It didn't work, I don't think. They have like a complicated process where they roll things back, and people will sort of uh, decline offers, etc., to give people a better preference if they ask for it. And then they go into sort of a, a more sort of standard allocating of offers. There's a link there to the Queensland page. There's all your links there. The Queensland do, does in their Group D include medical graduates of international universities who have not completed an internship in Australia or another country and have either obtained the AMC certificate, that's the Australian Medical Council exams part one and two, or the MCQ, the multiple choice. So it is possible for an international doctor to apply to Queensland and maybe three or four people are successful that every year in doing that, I understand. Uh, it's certainly a handful. But you see, it's quite strictly limited and one of the things it's limited around is if you're an IMG doctor that's already done your internship or you weren't required to do an internship in your country and certainly if you've worked now already, you're not eligible for that. So I think the reason they have that open is, you know, there are certain limited circumstances where AMC doc doctors from other countries haven't been able to do their internship in their own country. Maybe they, you know, there's war or other things that have happened that they've had to leave, whatever. And they've come to Australia and they need a chance to do an internship. So that's why that's open. You know, as an IMG doctor with more experience, you do also have the opportunity to apply for a bigger range of jobs across Australia for particularly resident medical officer jobs as they come vacant, including in Queensland. So that is the route for a sort of limited, strict limited uh, set of international doctors for Queensland. Western Australia, and I'm going to sort of start skimming a little bit more because it's kind of the same. Good salary, 
probably I think it's the best yes it's the best in the country we don't know the current numbers but based on 2021 it's going to be about around 30 you do have some options again working rurally they have a three-year contract there is no professional development allowance however uh, we're not sure where our orientation starts there are no actual intern eligibility and priorities in WA uh, for some reason just it all works out for them I think but uh, I mean there are certain eligibility requirements but there's no priority list I should say and you can see that you've got this little you know, basically five hospital service networks that basically based around Perth-based hospitals, and then there's the WA Country Health Service. Coordinated by the Postgraduate Medical Council of Western Australia, but you apply through the WA job site, links are there as well. South Australia, $77,000 a year, 301 posts, including 18 rural. And again, you've got those similar priority lists Australian citizens and permanent residents that have graduated from a South Australian university, uh, from elsewhere, uh, temporary residents, etc, etc. It's under Category 5, medical graduates of an overseas university, but you have to have done a few other things uh, at, uh, first, and it's about, they do have an option to apply for the rural preferential, as well as in the sort of final round there as well. But again, it's quite strictly limited. And again, it's, I think, based on whether you've done an internship or not as well. Tasmania, we're waiting for them to up to date, but last year they had 92. Their PAT salary is probably the second worst, I think. Only one year contract. You don't get a professional development allowance as an intern, but residents do get an allowance. Their term starts very early in the year. You will be allocated to one of three sites, a Hobart site, North, uh, Launceston site, or the Northwest region. I think there's kind of some general practice things that you can do, particularly under the Tasmanian Rural Journalist Program, where you get a 13-week rural GP placement. But other than that, if you're allocated to one of those sites, I think you're generally based at that hospital. There's not that many, there's, there are only, depending on how you counted, three or four major hospitals in uh, Tasmania. Again, similar priority lists, links there below. Northern Territory, again, we've not, we're waiting for updated information. You can see the contract about 79,000, one year contract. There is a professional development allowance. Uh, we're not sure when the term starts. Basically, two options to apply. The top end health service based upon the Royal Darwin Hospital and the Central Australia based upon Alice Springs. You can see the rotations that you are part of those hospitals. Again, it, it is possible for people with international medical degree applicants to apply, but they expect that you've had previous experience in the Northern Territory or experience in rural, remote and Indigenous health uh, locations. Finally, for the State and Territory round, we have the ACT. Again, waiting for them to update numbers. An interesting part about the ACT is that 95 of those numbers are guaranteed to New South Wales medical students, which reflects the fact that some of the placements for ACT Health are actually in New South Wales around the, the South Coast, Bega and Goulburn, etc. Uh, again, similar priority rankings for ACT. And then finally, we have the Commonwealth Private Hospital Stream. So I might do a separate, more detailed version of video about this maybe later in the year. Uh, we don't have the information available yet because it's a scheme that actually goes a bit later. Uh, and you mean, remember I talked about how the sort of number of internship positions around the country are partly determined by the states and territories making sure they've got enough for their obligation under the Commonwealth Agreement, which is called COAG. Well, this is about the Commonwealth also providing additional placements, particularly for international students, to make sure that there are enough placements for everyone who's graduating from medical school in Australia to get an internship. Technically, there aren't enough placements, but what happens every year is some people who graduate from medical school take up an internship placement uh, in the country that they came from, say, uh, places like Canada and Malaysia, for example, we have a lot of students studying here, and so it is possible for doctors in those countries to get an internship back in the country that they came from. So between a combination of international students taking up placements in other countries where they're eligible and the spare posts that are offered by the states and territories and this Commonwealth scheme, basically at a certain point, usually around January, February every year, the, the number of people wanting still to have an intern position in Australia becomes zero. Um, and that's how it's all sorted out. This scheme's been in place for a while. It's probably, it's sort of, it's not sure if it'll ever, you know, continue or whatever, but it looks like it's here to stay. And you can see that every year there's about 115 internships allocated. And then some spare places for postgraduate year two and three eligible doctors, usually other people continuing on the scheme or maybe from elsewhere. So it's done by an annual EOI 
process where they basically put out an expression of interest to generally private facilities to look after, take on internships as part of their, their hospital placement for trainee doctors. And it's again very limited. You Basically it's mainly for Priority One candidates. So if you're a full fee paying international student and you completed all your degree in Australia and have met the medical board English language requirements, not Australian citizen, commit to getting a work visa, that it's for you basically. So it is for those non-citizen graduates of Australian medical schools. And then if there's any spare, this is probably for IMGs who are already in the system because you have to have provisional registration as a medical practitioner. So part, what that would help help with is things like you've got a, you know, you're on the standard pathway, you've got a position in as a RMO in the emergency department, but you need to do some medicine terms, and some surgery terms. Well, if you could get one of these spots, that would help you probably do that. So that all happens a bit later in the year. So if you're interested in that process or you think you might need that process, watch this space. I'll probably do a separate video about it later in the year as well. And and you can see the, the, the hospitals from last year that are funded there. Interestingly, a lot in Queensland, a couple in, you know, one in New South Wales, no, two in New South Wales, uh, three in New South Wales, uh, one in Victoria uh, and quite a few in West Australia. So none in South Australia, Tasmania, Northern Territory, ACT. And there's a link to the current information of that program as well. There's a bit of an FAQ at the bottom of this blog. I'm not going to go through that. I think that's enough for the roundup. Interested if you're uh, in the process of applying or found any problems or identified any things that are incorrect with the information that are provided. I'll leave a comment in the box below and I will see you in another video. Bye for now.